Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Coming out of its decline in the 20th century, Russia, under President Vladimir Putin, has asserted its position in the Middle East in particular and the world stage at large. Moscow's efforts encompass the entire region from the Persian Gulf to the Western Mediterranean. Does Russia's record match its rhetoric in fulfilling its ambitions? To discuss this matter, I'm joined here in the studio by Professor Zev Khanin, who is the academic chairman of the Institute for Eurasian Studies. Welcome. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Professor Efraim Inbar, who is the president of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Welcome. As well as Dr. Stephanie Hoffman, who is the former director of the Mayrock Russian and East European Research Center at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Welcome. Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding of the specific topic. Uh, under uh, President Putin, um, Russia has asserted uh, its traditional position in the Middle East going back to the 1960s and 70s, or reasserted its position following the decline which you uh, mentioned, especially in Syria, but also in other places. And uh, it has uh, filled at least partly the vacuum left by the um, United States as um, it is in the process uh, of withdrawal. As for Israel, uh, one should look uh, at statements made recently by both uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and the uh, ambassador to uh, Tel Aviv, Anatoly Viktorov. And uh, they mentioned the uh, Russian wish to take part in the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations, which have stalled. Um, what was uh, frequently mentioned was that um, in 2016, President Putin offered and Prime Minister Netanyahu accepted in principle, as well as uh, did um, the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, to meet in Moscow to negotiate between Israel and Palestine under Russian auspices. However, uh, this never materialized. And the Russians uh, hope uh, that uh, this will happen. Of course, this will mean that Israel, along with the Palestinians, uh, is moving away from uh, the uh, American uh, auspices towards uh, Russian mediation. This is not a realistic expectation, but nevertheless, because Russia is part of the so-called quartet, along with the United Nations, the European Union, and the United States, it wants at least a foothold in the Middle East peace process. Nevertheless, the Israeli-Palestinian issue is not on the priority list of the Russians when we're talking about the Middle East at large. Professor Hanin, can you elaborate on that? Well, in fact, uh, when Mr. Putin for the first time took his office in Moscow, uh, he took Russia, the country which lost his uh, status at the super, world superpower, still enjoying one of the biggest uh, nuclear arsenals, uh, but everybody accepted it as their original power, as, as the best. Uh, it took him about half a decade to change the rules of the game. Uh, when he came to Munich in 2007, he declared that their, you know, their old understandings are out, and not because, and that's not the Russian fault. Uh, from this point of view, uh, and from that time, uh, there were three objectives of the Russian foreign policy: uh, to be close with the Europeans and to make as much as possible uh, uh, to make not to divide Europeans uh, from the United States, but still to promote uh, the understanding in the major European capitals, especially Berlin, and maybe some other places, uh, that uh, European might have an autonomous interest from their major ally. The second, actually, to reconsider, to, to arrange Russian power in the, what is called the, the close abroad, meaning uh, to come back to the understandings between the, his predecessors uh, that uh, all the territories of the former Soviet Union, besides maybe Baltic states, will be the ultimate uh, um, impact area uh, for Moscow. And third, to come back to the Middle East. Uh, the Middle East is not the major. Uh, interest of Russia, but still, for them, it is important to show that as far as they pre present in the Middle East, they are a superpower. Uh, and that uh, might, might be explain what all these uh, Russian evolutions here in the Middle East. They are trying to uh, come to uh, Sunni states 
to say that uh, despite the fact that they are allies of the Shia states like Iran and the regime of Assad in Syria, they still are interested to be present uh, in the, and to have a dialogue with the Sunni capitals. Uh, they are interested to be a part of the partners with their sort of a partners with Turkey. Uh, despite all these conflicts mm. between Turkey and the Arab states. And finally, last but not least, to show that they're probably the only power that is able to bring uh, Israelis, their friends, and Palestinians, their friends. That's not just the name. It's, it's uh, a sort of a, uh, it's a, sort of a status uh, that uh, in the Moscow foreign office, in the Russian foreign office, they give to, to these or that partners. So they bring Israeli and Palestinian friends to the negotiating table. Whether uh, uh, Russians believe that it, they will be successful, no, they do not believe. Uh, whether they are ready to continue that, yes, they are ready. Do uh, Dr. Hoffman, how do you uh, perceive this whole uh, Russian policy in the Middle East? Yeah, well, I, I agree that um, Russia... Uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, we really have to look back to what was going on in the Soviet period in order to understand uh, what is going on now. And um, part of it is an attempt for, uh, by Putin to reestablish Russia as a major power which uh, has to be considered on the international scene. Now, as we mentioned, it tried in uh, the, the near abroad, the former Soviet states. It didn't succeed terribly well. And the reset with America didn't work terribly well. Therefore, uh, it turned to the Middle East, where it not only had traditional allies among the uh, Muslim Arab states, uh, but now, after uh, Gorbachev reestablished relations with Israel, it presented itself as a uh, per power that could speak to both. However, I would say that if we look at what they have accomplished, the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict is the least likely to be successful. It is something that they have put their name as we, we offered this. In fact, they were the first ones to invite Hamas after uh, they took over Gaza, and uh, they've maintained a friendship with Israel. It's interesting that one of the reasons they, the Russian foreign ministry gave for not participating in the recent Warsaw Conference was that it, they said they were not going to discuss the major s problem in the Middle East, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's interesting that mm. they said that, and they gave that as a reason not to participate. Well, first but I, oh, I just want to add, I think shortly. on the Syrian front, they've been a lot more successful, and that there they really succeeded in helping get America, mm. America out of there, and, and they succeeded in many of their goals. Well, uh, about the Syrian conflict, I'd like to ask you, Professor Inbal. Prime Minister B. Netanyahu has traveled many times to Moscow over the last several years. Since 2012, uh, in particular, it's been very frequent due to a coordinated mechanism, uh, which was uh, formed at the time by uh, Yair Golan, uh, who used to be the uh, deputy IDF chief of staff. This whole process that uh, evolved was, uh, in particular, very uh, specific to the Syrian front, nothing to do with the uh, Israeli-Arab conflict. It had to do with the fact that Syria wanted to uh, diminish Iranian influence in Syria and oust its ground forces and, and uh, actual activities from penetrating and establishing a contingent from the Islamic Republic through Iraq, Syria, uh, to Lebanon, and to the Mediterranean Sea. To what degree do you see this uh, uh, activities by Israel to try and court uh, Moscow and President uh, Vladimir Putin by uh, the Russian uh, uh, Federation? Well, first of all, I must say that what resonates in the Middle East is the Russian willingness to use force. We are talking about elites that speak realpolitik, and Putin speaks realpolitik very well. This is also what makes uh, the Israeli-Russian uh, relationship uh, useful. I'm not sure it's unique, but it's useful because uh, we, Israel definitely doesn't want to um, fight uh, the Russians. The Russians are a strong power. On the other hand, also the Russians uh, don't want uh, to fight uh, the Israeli Air Force. They have uh, not very good memories from an exchange in the 1970s when Israel downed uh, several uh, Russian airplanes uh, in in Egypt, uh, and uh, they uh, as well. yeah. and they understand that uh, their efforts 
to stabilize uh, Assad regime uh, can be undermined by Israeli activities. So there is a very good understanding, a real political understanding uh, between the two countries and uh, the very uh, many visits of uh, Netanyahu to uh, Putin are based, first of all, on a real political language. They speak the same language. Second, I think the Israelis are very careful to award the Russians uh, great respect for what they've done during World War II, and uh, they have respect for the Russian nation, Russian culture. All this is part of the Israeli parlance vis-a-vis the Russians. We make sure that uh, we give the respect they think they deserve. Indeed, and uh, also during the last meeting of uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin, uh, the Israeli leader invited his Russian, uh, uh, not counterpart, but uh, the Russian leader to come to uh, Israel and partake in a special ceremony uh, honoring the Red Army during World War II, which liberated also a lot of Jews from uh, various concentration camps during the heinous crimes of uh, the Nazi regime at the time. Uh, Mr. Oren, can you elaborate on that? Yes, it's um, a major theme in uh, in Russian uh, propaganda or in, in Russian rhetoric uh, <laughs> to uh, recall uh, the role of uh, the uh, Soviets in World War II in the victory over the uh, Nazis. And this um, serves several purposes. Um, a minor ma- one might be to remind people while they are holding on to Japanese islands, which was part of the the price that the Western allies paid them for joining the fight against Japan very late in the war, after they were not needed any longer. But uh, what what, yes, what what uh, they uh, they really want to emphasize is that the agreement reached at Yalta between the uh, big three still holds. And therefore, the division of Europe to spheres of influence should still apply. And um, whoever says that uh, uh, the Soviets uh, had only a minor impact on victory in Europe and that only after D-Day uh, where the Nazis uh, defeated, they, they resent that and they resent what the Polish government is doing now. And this uh, causes Netanyahu to be in a very precarious position because Netanyahu sees himself as an ally of the uh, Polish government, but he also needs to be on Putin's good side because of what is happening in the region. The watchword for Russia was mentioned here is stability. Of course, stability on their terms. They want to stabilize Syria under the Assad regime. They know that Israel can upset the apple cart if Israel uh, sees its interests being hampered by the Iranians or by others, and therefore they want to reach a modus vivendi with Israel. Uh, Professor Hanin, you've been uh, for many years now the top scientist of the Ministry of Aliyah in uh, Klita here in Israel, and are considered to be one of the top experts on uh, the Russian-speaking people living in Israel. Uh, Something that, uh, on the one hand, uh, the Israeli government declared on multiple occasions as the bridge between Israel and the uh, Russian-speaking world as well as Moscow in particular. And on the other hand, uh, President Vladimir Putin has all the time said, uh, we have about a million brothers and sisters living in Israel uh, and uh, uh, keeps mentioning that on different fronts. Of course, uh, uh, there is a lot of connections. Not everything is uh, truly that harmonious, but uh, uh, it does exist there. To what degree do you think that uh, Russia sees the, the state of Israel as a potential ally for many different uh, fronts in the region, and to what degree, on the other hand, Israel views uh, Russia as a potential ally, considering the fact that it is uh, in cahoots with the Assad regime, a sworn enemy of the state of Israel, as well as with uh, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran that declares uh, its aspiration to annihilate the Jewish state, and also uh, among the few nations around the world, it does not view Hezbollah or Hamas as terrorist organizations two organizations that their sworn uh, pledge is to destroy the state of Israel? Well, uh, uh, you asked three different questions. I'll try to answer them briefly. Uh, well, during one of my visits to Russian foreign office in the Smolensk Square, I saw a map. They showed me a map uh, under the entitled uh, uh, 
the Russia's world, Ruski Mir. Uh, and uh, uh, all this map shows the concentration of the Russian speakers, which are, uh, should be an ultimate part of the culture influence of Russia. So you see uh, territory of the former Soviet Union, of course, you see a little bit of Poland uh, it, uh, in, in rows, you know, less mm -hmm. than the, the other territory. And the very deep red, the territory of the state of Israel. Uh, so they say uh, that, of course, this 1.1 uh, uh, million of brothers and sisters are actually an ultimate part of allies of the Russia culture influence. And of course, uh, uh, Israel is the brother state. And they expect that Israel should understand uh, Russia um, in a much better way than anybody else. And of course, uh, Mr. Netanyahu uh, demonstrates within every occasion that we understand the Russian position and its role in the Second World War, probably the, the more, most popular element a couple of years ago uh, in Russia. Спасибо деду за победу, если надо повторим. Thanks to my grandfather for the victory, and if needed, we will do it again. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, all this, that is sort of a message uh, inside the Russian public, which is sick and tired of uh, all this, uh, you know, all these evolutions uh, of the Russian foreign policy, and here in agree with, with, with Stepany, uh, that, their, that their policy was not deadly successful. Uh, uh, all these projects are very ex uh, expensive. Uh, the Ukraine was very exp and Crimea, it was very ex expensive. Um, uh, Georgia, and Paul, uh, at the end of the world, it appeared to be very expensive. Uh, Syrian program is very expensive. At the moment, uh, uh, if you will have a look at the Levada Center um, uh, pulse, uh, you will see that Russian public uh, time and again ask the question whether we need all this at the expense of our pensions, the expense of a level of life, quality of life, and so on and so forth. So Russia is interested to do something cheap, uh, to make uh, uh, peace between Israelis and Palestinians. It's a very cheap. Uh, it will never happen. I remember that in 2008, uh, after the Annapolis, uh, uh, somebody, a guy in the foreign office, Russian, told me, okay, when Americans will fail, we will suggest to Israelis and Palestinians to come in Moscow. Never happened. Okay, we will suggest. Uh, then, uh, uh, in 2016, uh, they suggested Russia uh, as the place to come to, to bring back, uh, uh, to bring to the negotiation table uh, Palestinian Arabs and Israelis. It never happened because uh, uh, Russians supported uh, um, uh, Mr. Obama claim in the, uh, in the, uh, the um, uh, Security Council. And now they're trying to do it again. So from this point of view, I would say that everybody understands that Russian community in Israel is not a pro-Russian lobby. Uh, uh, in Israel, they understand that Russian understand, but they still play the game. May I, may I interject for a second? Well, peace, peace between Israel and an Arab party is never cheap. The only problem is that the matchmaker must pay the bride and the groom, contrary to practice. And therefore, only the Americans and perhaps some rich European countries can, can really uh, nego negotiate. I would agree completely with you that um, it's very nice to talk to uh, Netanyahu, it's very nice for him to invite us and so on. But in the end, it is only America in terms of Israel and the Palestinian conflict that can decide. However, we must remember that uh, Russia does have the possibility of being a spoiler. And that's part of its tactics in the Middle East. If it doesn't succeed, uh, then it can spoil by, again, supporting the demands of Ham Hamas versus Israel, or whatever it wants to do to be a spoiler. So that, indeed, has to be taken into consideration um, by Israel. If I may just you know, go back, speaking of, it's very interesting in terms of what Russia is trying to do. Um, and uh, not only should we go back to the Soviet period, but it's very interesting that both um, Primakov, who was the outstanding uh, foreign minister, and the current one, Lavrov, both refer to a 19th century Russian foreign minister, Alexander Gorchakov, as the person they like to emulate. And the idea is to succeed, not who was the prime minister after the Crimean War, which Russia, of course, suffered from, and was trying to make a comeback. So again, we have post-Soviet Russia trying to make a comeback. And Gorchakov, the 19th century diplomat, is their hero. And the idea is to do it by diplomacy, not arms. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And therefore, I think we can say Russia is to a certain extent succeeding in that. Nevertheless, uh, the main question remains, is Russia really that successful in the Middle East as it uh, uh, keeps stating over and over and over again, uh, of course, there have been hiccups with Turkey uh, when uh, the uh, the Turkish uh, surface-to-air missile struck down the Russian plane and uh, the, uh, bilateral relations deteriorated. Nevertheless, they improved later and now they have an ongoing project of uh, uh, building a nuclear reactor for Ankara, something that uh, wouldn't have been uh, in the foresight in the near future. Turkey has shifted clearly eastwards also on the matters of Syria, where it is uh, uh, cooperating closely with the Russians on the matter, uh, now also uh, improving relations with the Assad regime. But uh, also the Russians have the relations with Turkey's enemy or rival, Egypt, where it's also establishing now uh, a nuclear reacting, uh, reactor for that country. Saudi Arabia is talking about a nuclear reactor with Russia. Russia seems to be everywhere. But is that really substance to all that discussion? Well, first of all, uh, I think that uh, there is a Russian presence. Uh, selling nuclear reactors to a country means dependency for 50 years on Russian uh, uranium uh, uh, roads for the nuclear reactor. So there is some influence. There are some arms sales, which, uh, of course, uh, are beneficial to the Russian arms industry. Uh, and uh, the Russians speak to everybody, including Hamas. Um, they speak to the Iranians. So uh, they are uh, projecting uh, some kind of influence in the Middle East. Although I must say that uh, in the Middle East, it is the small countries that uh, played with uh, superpowers and uh, abuse them, use them. Uh, so uh, I don't think this pattern has changed uh, dramatically, particularly after the end of the Cold War. So it actually is, uh, the states here have greater freedom of action to play uh, uh, the superpowers one against each other, and uh, they uh, use them. The Russians are ready to be used to, because they benefit from it. Uh, but uh, we should not uh, obf obfuscate the picture that uh, is not always understood in the world, that the Middle East is not run by the superpowers. There is great uh, freedom of action in, in this region. Dr. Hoffman, you wanted to comment? I think there's a certain irony, in a way, that ever since the fall of, this, of, of the superpower game, Russia has been proclaiming the need for a multipolar world. And this is what the way they want to conduct diplomacy throughout the world. Well, they got it in the Middle East. However, it winds up being incredibly complicated, and you find yourself with one country both aligned on certain issues and conflicting, if we look at Syria, for example, uh, on the one hand, supposedly Russia and Iran are getting along fine. But on the other hand, they do have, they're both very wary of the other's presence in Syria, and they have their own interests, particularly in a post-Civil War where they want both to be involved in building it up economically and so on. So it, it works all kinds of ways, this multipolar world. Which leads me to a question to you, Mr. Owen. When we're talking about Russia, to what degree, uh, nobody disputes its military might and its capabilities on that front, but with an economy the size of Italy, for instance, uh, to what degree can it really employ that might in a region embroiled in so many outstretched uh, uh, arenas? It cannot, uh, which is why it wants to project uh, the uh, perception that it can. And uh, there is a revival, of course, of uh, admiration and uh, longing to uh, heroes past, such as Peter the Great, and even Stalin uh, has been, uh, uh, to some extent, uh, rehabilitated uh, by uh, many prominent uh, Russians uh, of late. And, of course, uh, Putin sees himself as either a Tsar or um, a great leader um, on on a par with with perhaps uh, Stalin, so he wouldn't want to put it in in a test. Uh, but uh, as long as people believe that you are powerful, they behave accordingly. And Russia doesn't want to be stuck in the Black Sea; it wants to have a Mediterranean uh, squadron 
based at Latakia in Syria. Professor Khanin, considering the fact that Russia's economy is not that strong, would it uh, seek out, for instance, China, which has more of a powerful economy rather than a powerful military, to become somewhat of a patron in joint efforts to confront the United States and uh, impact uh, various global arenas in a larger scale, including the Middle East in particular. Moscow still is not interested to get a situation of so-called three-party model. Uh, they uh, probably gave up of the opportunity to become a sort of a moderator between Washington and Beijing. It was not going to happen. Uh, in fact, they're interested to establish their bilateral relations with the, each side. But here in the Middle East, and here I agree with the colleagues, uh, they got this multi parallel world. They didn't get it in any other world, place in the world. And they are trying to uh, preserve their presence as much as possible. Well, we're drawing near to the end of the program, so I'd like to give each and every one of you the opportunity to have a closing statement. Dr. Hoffman, we'll start with you. I think that um, if we look particularly at Syria, that uh, Russia has managed to make itself a power in which uh, it's, it has the say in what will happen uh, in the, any future settlement. And it has also, in, in that sense, been successful uh, in having America withdraw from the scene. So it, it's not getting any place, I think, with the Palestinian-Israeli mm -hmm. issue. But it certainly has had successes, even with its uh, limited economic power. But the, if I just one more thing. Unfortunately, we don't have the time. Uh, Professor Inbao? I think that we can see, uh, indeed, the Russian successes, but I'm not sure they'll be able to capitalize on those successes uh, in the future. Professor Hanin? Well, uh, Mr. Putin is going to visit Israel uh, for opening of the memorial for the Leningrad blockade and battle. Uh, and I believe that they're trying to uh, show as much as possible uh, that uh, they are much more than Spiler uh, here in the Middle East. Also, uh, if, if, uh, if it's not more than Spiler. Mr. Owen? Russia is a bit overrated, but if you uh, remember Sarah Palin, who used to say that when she looks out uh, her window in Alaska, she sees Russia. This was a bit exaggerated. Israelis can look out of their window and see Russia in the Middle East. Well, that's all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank Professor Hanin, Mr. Oren, Professor Inbal, and Dr. Hoffman for being here today. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's call, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.